So we have uh, Jose Manuel, we have uh, Alison, and we have Laura. We're going to be uh, basically discussing about these uh, funding uh, options that are available for right holders and uh, music companies. So first of all, I would like you to introduce yourselves and tell us a little bit about yourself, your, your career, and what you're doing right now. And we can start, if you want, with Jose Manuel, because you are in minority. So let's start with you, please. <laughs> Okay, thank you very much. Uh, I think it's an honor to be here. So I would like to thank uh, uh, Jordi for inviting us to, to have this opportunity to, to talk about financing. Myself, I'm part of uh, La Rosa Music Group. In La Rosa Music Group, we have two, I mean, the company uh, have two different parts. I mean, the first one is the music. My partner, Christian, is a musician. He has been in the music for uh, more than 20 years. And I'm more the part of the of the finance because, obviously, in 2016 we realized because we live uh, we 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 have that experience in our skins that um, um, that we have a problem. I mean, we were doing music and also, uh, he was doing music and he has a problem. He needs some cash, and we decided to look for a solution. Here in Spain was very very difficult to find a solution, and we discovered that in the U.S there were some solutions. So we took a plane, we went to Denver, we sit down with the people there with uh, royalties changed, and we find that uh, in the US, there is a widespread of a span of solutions for funding, uh, to find solution about funding or getting some cash uh, if you have a catalog or an IP. Um, since, since that day, we realized that we need to explore these solutions because I think in the US, it's a huge market, but I think Europe is also a huge market related in, in when we talk about music, when we talk about IP. Um, and I mean, after having that experience, we start to work with some partners in the US and we start to find that there were a lot of opportunities across the world uh, in order to sell or buy catalogs. There were a lot of interests of investor, mainly in the US, because I think in, in Europe is still um, a long way to educate the investor in order to be appealed because because of a, a catalog, and we we really uh, have this as a challenge because I remember in 2016 very few people were talking about this, and and well we do our way in order to get um, people creators. Uh, to know our solutions in La Rosa Music Group and also educate um, people in, in the financial industry in order to, to, to show them that there is an, an opportunity there. Excellent. Thank you, Jose Manuel. Alison, what's, what's your background? What, you know, what's your experience on, on financing and in which ways? Well, I have, uh, I have many years in the industry on the record company side. And uh, when I had my own record company many years ago, we had a need to raise finance and I went to an, a UK bank who valued our catalog at zero <laughs> and I went to an American bank who valued it at 34 million dollars yeah. and this was in the late 80s and this tells you exactly what you have just described um, later on when I started AIM which was the Association of Independent Music which Trade Association for Independent Companies, I went to government and lobbied them about access to finance because you know access to finance is one of the key uh, barriers to success. And with the UK government, we produced a report called Banking on a Hit. And in that, it showed that we had the skills, we had the expertise, we had the value in the companies. Um, and we took that to the finance industry and it fell on completely deaf ears because we were moving into what we call the digital economy, the knowledge economy. Were you to get a loan from a bank pre the digital economy, you either had to sleep with the bank manager, know his brother, walk his dog. I mean, it was so subjective and not based on science at all. Um, but with the digital economy, you lost the ability, even if you did sleep with the bank manager, to, 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 to put stocks and debtors in. Because stocks and debtors were the way in which they 
covered their risk. They could take your stock, they could take the money owed to you. So in the end, banking on a hit became banging on a bit. Because I don't think it moved or changed anything. You're absolutely right. The European mentality about funding is very much behind the US. If you look at Twitter, if you look at uh, Amazon, I mean, in the late 90s, Amazon made a loss of four billion pounds in one year, but were financed. And look at them today. Mm -hmm. Look at Twitter. No business model at all, but momentum funding, as in you get enough eyeballs and eventually something will happen. These are models which are very established in the US and also IP in and of itself has long been valued because of Hollywood, I think. So yes, I've been on a mission uh, to, to try and change this. <laughs> Thank you very much for the introduction, Alison. Amazing work. And Laura, what, what's your background and, and what are you doing right now? Yes, so thanks a lot, first of all, and I'm very pleased to be here with you. Uh, I, um, I work at the European Investment Fund, so this is a European institution, and um, I think 2016 was a symbolic year also <laughs> for, for myself, but also the, um, the EIF, the European Investment Fund, in supporting the, the CCS, the cultural and creative sectors and, and music. Uh, so I joined the AIF in 2016, and that was the year that we launched the first program that was uh, specifically focusing on the support of the cultural and creative sectors. And uh, this was the result, I think, of all the feedback that um, the European Union was getting from the market and the acknowledgement that there is a um, huge difficulty to access finance uh, for the CCS, uh, precisely because uh, financiers may not be um, uh, familiar with valuing IP, as uh, Alison explained, but also other specificities of the sector. So uh, the launch of uh, the Cultural and Creative, creative Sectors Grantee Facility that was the very first uh, pan-European financial instrument to support um, CCS and music. Uh, happened in 2016, and um, this was also an, an attempt to educate, as you are saying, um, the, the financing industry to, to better serve this sector. So. Um, I, I will explain later on, I think, uh, what exactly yeah, is yeah. this, uh, but yes, uh, I'm uh, happy to, to be here and share the insights. Thank with you, you so much. Um, so, uh, Jose Manuel, you, were, you, you gave us like the very, very broad overview of what was happening before, you know, before 2016 and all the difference that Alison confirmed about the US approach and European approach, but since then, like in the last five years, We've seen the rise of hypnosis, which is like a British, British investment uh, vehicle. So it's, it's not Europe, Alison, okay? Maybe, you know, but uh, it's not oh, mainland I wish, Europe. I but, wish it were. Yeah, okay, it were. <laughs> but, uh, but uh, it is close to Europe. Yeah. So could you give us like a little bit of, of a summary on how this has changed? So how, how these last five years evolution, all these new players to give us like a, an idea of, of what has happened and has changed the mentality of everyone now we have like pension funds and everyone sort of investing yeah. in that? Yeah, I mean, in my opinion, my humble opinion, I think, <laughs> uh, the main factor that has changed uh, the mentality of the investor, the way the investors see the music business, is the disruption of the, of the music platforms. I mean, Spotify and all these platforms right now are having, um, they change completely the industry in many ways and also they have an impact on the investors. I mean, we have to always have the mind of a, an investor. At the end of the, of the day, an investor is trying to look for safe investments. And with the disruption of this type of platforms, let's call it digitalization of the music, there are several factors that uh, impact in a good way to the music. The first one, I think, is the, the way of, I mean, I mean the, the part of consumption. We change from a one-off consumption, you buy a CD, to a consumption that is repeatable. You can repeat the consumption. And this repeatable consumption 
also makes that um, all the data uh, of, an of uh, someone who wants to invest in music is something that can be predictable. At the end of the day, I mean, we are changing from a very, very, uh, in, in a, from an industry with a very low quality of data in a, to an industry with a high quality of data and a high quantity of data. With this, all investors, they feel much more comfortable in order to make models and give value to the, to the investment. And I think this is the main factor. I think the, the disruption of the, of the digitalization of music platform in this industry was the main one. And I think obviously the second one could be uh, also hypnosis. Hypnosis has made a lot of uh, uh, positive impact because at the end of the day, uh, it's a company that is able to draw the attention of the media. And if you draw the attention of the media, a lot of investors that they were not looking for this type of investment, they will start to research and investigate. And then a lot of uh, new investors will uh, have this uh, uh, possibility into their future budgets or allocations into, uh, because I think uh, uh, investing in music uh, is, a, is a good investment. I mean, if you do in a proper way, you get uh, good advice, you, good, you get some good people around you to, to help you. I'm, I'm talking now uh, from the side of, of an artist, of a, uh, a right holder. Um, and you get a good proper valuation, at, at the end of the day, it's a good investment for, it could be a good investment for, for both sides, for the investor and for the artist. Excellent, and, and Alison, is this also translates into the debt side. So the last few years we've seen how this evolves. And could you explain a little bit like what, you know, what's the landscape now? Um, as you were saying, now there's more interest, but it's, um, we're not seeing like uh, in the same way as we've seen in the news, like hypnosis, buying this and buying that. We're not, we're not reading as many uh, debt deals uh, or we're not reading about <coughs> that. How, how, and you know, the, the music credit fund, uh, how, how this works? Well, there's a very <coughs> excuse me. <coughs> there's a very good reason why you don't read about our deals, because we uh, guarantee confidentiality to the lender. Beautiful, we like that. Uh, because obviously, if you're going to sell a catalogue or you're going to buy a catalogue, um, there is a big fanfare at the point of signing, and as you say, this has made hypnosis very visible. Uh, when you're uh, taking, uh, when you're borrowing money. And you might be borrowing money for all kinds of reasons. Um, then your um, your business strategy does not want to be put out there into the public space. This is a confidential transaction, so we guarantee that we don't talk about the deals that we do because it's a business transaction that doesn't have a, the, the end stop is when the loan is recouped, which is ten years. Um, and along the way, those companies might borrow more because they want to buy uh, another company or they want to uh, 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 expand in some way. So that's a very real difference in the visibility of different types of funding models. So you you know you have the bank, which is which is also quite quiet in terms of you know visibility to, to the deals that you do. I think for possibly the same reason, there's some sensitivity around, you know, I mean, if you were a record company and you w were on the front page of the trades going, oh, we've just borrowed two million pounds, or we've just borrowed five million pounds, your artists might be thinking, oh, I wonder why they've done that. You know, it might be slightly disturbing. Mm -hmm. So we, we don't advertise any of them. Excellent. And, and do we have data on the volumes? Because we, obviously that's, um, the, the specific deals are confidential, but because of the visibility of the of the acquisitions, we know that Hypnosis has invested a billion. Then uh, Blackstone came and put another billion and said that we put another four billion in. And then KKR came in and another billion is going to be on the table. All these billions and billions are like, uh, like our friend. Uh, we, we have a you know, tiny amount billions billions. of money compared to that. We have 300 million. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, but but in the set, as a set, like not, not only one fund, but as a sector. Uh, no, I don't know what other know. sectors okay. are. No, I mean, I think uh, what we're trying to do is to offer an alternative 
way of thinking about the asset value. The asset value is, as you say, very stable now. That is probably the only reason why the finance industry has come in for this feast, because streaming has become so predictable that as an asset class, which is what music is described as in the finance world, and it's an uncorrelated asset, which means that it doesn't rely on the harvest or war or disruption. It's, it is just a very pure, uncorrelated asset that has a space in the world and earns a certain amount of money every month. I mean, Universal's figures yesterday were the, pr the prediction is stable and strong. So this, I think, describes the music industry in, in total as stable and strong. But then, why would you choose, and it's, it's not for me to judge why an artist would sell, completely sell, and lose all control forever. And obviously, some people have very complicated lives, and they think the big check is the way to realize the value. And for them, that's perfectly OK, and that's perfectly fine. But are they getting the full value? Because there is a question there. If this asset is so hot, why are you selling it? Mm -hmm. You see? If you want to leverage the value and not sell, that, that's what we offer. You keep, the, you keep the asset so that your family, your children, the grandchildren, because authors' rights are 70 years post-death. Mm -hmm. So that long, long stable, strong economy, if you sell here, you probably are, even though these figures seem extraordinary, you probably are undervalued, you probably are underselling. Now, very interesting. Yeah, I heard the expression that the, the, the copyrights and the, in the digital space are like the, the real state of the music industry for the investors, and a little bit what you were saying about the, being so stable. And, and yeah, selling versus debt also, I've read in some articles uh, that try to explain why Bob Dylan would sell or why uh, Neil Young would sell. And actually, was uh, I read that one of the reasons, and I don't know if it's true or not, I just read that in an article, that is precisely to leave the state in a very more manageable way for the, for, for the you know, their sons or their heirs of, of, the, of the fortune, because managing like a, the collections of copyrights and all that, it's, it can yeah. be complex. So I can see exactly what you're saying, the point why someone would go one on one route, but if you are like 25, 30, you have like 40 years old, you have like half of your creative value in front of you, why, why would you do uh, a sale when you can get all the resources? Um, and later we're gonna go back in, in, actually after giving this overview, what are the options for, and how this works exactly, right? But before then, um, I would like, Laura, if you could now explain to the audience mm -hmm. what are the new resources that the European investment funds will make available for the creative industries. Uh, you were telling me before that it's, it's going to be uh, yeah. almost immediately in the, in, the, in the very near future that there are going to be new uh, resources from the European exactly. investment fund. Maybe before that, just to give a bit of uh, background for sure. the audience to sure, understand sure. what we're doing. So. Um, as I said, we are a European institution, part of the European Investment Bank Group, and we have create uh, we we were created uh, 20 years um, 28 years ago with the mission to support access to finance for uh, small businesses of the European Union, and we do that in parallel to supporting key EU objectives, uh, so the the key uh, objectives of the European Commission which is also one of our shareholders. And how do we support the small businesses and also businesses in the music industry is, is mainly by, uh, by two means. One is that we provide guarantees to banks or other financial institutions so that they can give loans out to those businesses that we want to support. In this specific case, uh, Right, music right holders or other uh, companies from the music industry. Uh, so a loan that uh, a, a small business will get 
from the bank that is working with us, it's going to be partially guaranteed by the EU, uh, which means uh, in practice that uh, the terms of the loan uh, will be better for the, for the borrower. Uh, that's one way we intervene into the market. The other uh, way is that because of our guarantees, the banks lend more and lend to sectors that they will have not considered before. And the cultural and creative sectors is uh, one of the very um, prominent examples of this, because as we said before, lack of familiarity, specific nature, and all the, the factors that make the, the sectors uh, less familiar with the financiers. So, one way is the guarantees. The second way we work is uh, by making equity investments into investment funds. So we're limited partners into investment funds that they are then investing into companies that we want to support. So say, um, for example, if there is a, a fund investing into catalogs that want to get financing from the EIF, um, they can um, apply to our call for expression of interest and get financing and then they can use our capital to invest in those companies that uh, we want to support. And more recently with the new products, uh, we have a third, um, actually started already before in a small, a small case uh, and also only for the cultural and creative sectors. Uh, it's a new line of business that we are developing now, which is advisory. And uh, with this, we are aiming to educate both the financial institutions and investment funds to, uh, for them to gain the, the knowledge of the different sectors and, and, in that, and, uh, and um, thematics, as we call them, that we want to support so that they can better provide the financing needed. Uh, indeed, now, I mentioned before that we started with the cultural and creative sectors guarantee facility, so that was covering only one side of our business and guarantees to banks. Uh, it was very difficult to implement because it was very difficult to attract the attention from banks to um, convince them to give loans to, to the cultural and creative sectors, but uh, luckily it went very well. And uh, thanks to this success, uh, in the InvestEU program, which is the new program of the European Union. It just started now and will last for the next seven years. We are going to expand the support uh, to also include equity investments. So the calls for expression of interest are out. They have been launched in April, this April. And so any bank or any uh, investment fund that is uh, willing to work with us they can apply and they, they can um, become financial intermediaries and also the, um, the businesses from the music uh, sector can direct themselves to those uh, financial intermediaries that we will be working with so that they get, get the financing needed. That's amazing. And, the, and the, the, the advisory, you're giving the advisory not to the creative industries, but no. to the investors and the banks so that exactly. they learn how to, how to deal with us, basically. <laughs> <laughs> okay. No, that's Excellent. true. But we've used you to explain yeah. also to our financial intermediaries uh, in the previous um, a program that we had for capacity building, as we, as we call it. Uh, we brought together the different actors so that uh, one to get the other and uh, we get to the um, uh, result that we, we aim to. Amazing, congratulations for this uh, incredible work. And Jose Manuel, going back now, we've, we've given the overviews, uh, historical, mm -hmm. what, what is going on now. Let's get like into the, you know, deep into it. So if there's like IP right holders here that are considering um, the options of funding, how a catalog acquisition works? Is it for, has to be for the whole of the repertoire, can be for part? How, you know, what alternatives are there? Because we've, I've mentioned Neil yep. Young and, and Bob Dylan. Is only for this profile of artists? Is it available or it makes sense or not for uh, medium income uh, composers or IP right holders like 
publishing companies as well? Sorry, I'm making a lot of questions in yeah, one, but yeah, no how problem. this works for you know the audience if someone is thinking about that? Yeah, I think um, the market uh, right now is, is um, creating their own liars. I mean, obviously there is a market for the, uh, for the big. I mean, I, hypnosis, primary wave, uh, you can read on the news the multiples that they are getting uh, for their ink, for their catalogs, that I think it's uh, quite amazing uh, because they are very high, but at the end of the day, they are brands. I mean, they are brands that they don't need to invest so much money on marketing in the coming 20 years. So they are kind of economies of scale when they are doing that, that investment. But obviously, there is a market for, for everybody. I, I think... Uh, uh, we have a, a appetite from investor for any kind of catalogs, for any kind of, of uh, deals, because at the end of the day, um, we are very, very strong advising uh, the right holder and also the investor how to structure the operation. Uh, for example, we were talking about the buyouts. I mean, there are buyouts of 100% of the future cash flow, and you take the, the control of the catalogs, but also there are operations that many, many investors, they don't have those skills to have 100% of the catalogs. They are more interested on in buying, for example, partial uh, cash flow, like 50% of the future cash flow. Why they are interested on in this type of deals? At the end of the day, they are investors. They don't want to be involved in the, on the, on the working on those catalogs. They are more, uh, in interested on keeping the owner as a part of the deal, like 50%, 25%, and at the end of the day, it's an incentive for investor and the owner. They will share the upside of that catalog. If everything goes well, both uh, parties will make good money. If everything goes bad, both parties will equally share the, the downsides as well. So I think there is a market for uh, for almost everybody. I think it's more difficult for thi this type of investment for the young composers, because I th uh, at the end of the day, it's very important, the historical. When, when you are talking, uh, nowadays, when you are talking of buying out, you see that the main deals are happening with the people that are more than 20 years on the market. Mm -hmm. uh, but one important thing is uh, for an investor, is to feel comfortable, and to feel comfortable means that you are producing some incomes for at least two or three years. So basically, if you are a new composer, it's going to be very hard, it's going to be very difficult, but uh, if you are uh, already having some historical performance, uh, I think it's a perfectly uh, good, I mean, it's, it's, there is a appetite for your catalog if you want. I mean, one of our strengths is First of all, to talk to the right holder, advise, listen what he wants to do, and, and at the end of the day, we, we are pretty sure that we can find a fit for, the, for, the, for some investor. We, sometimes we use our pockets to buy catalogs. Sometimes when we don't have enough money, we can go to a network of investors that we have in the US, and they, they are uh, they trust on us perfect. I mean, because we were working with them for more than 10 years, so they really trust on us, so. Excellent, so basically, if you are like a completely new artist, it's not gonna happen, but if you are like what we could describe as a, as a middle income, middle class, wherever you wanna say, like there has a, already a career going on with some years of traction, you mm -hmm. could think about that. And can you also um, sell or buy types of rights? Or territories, or is it possible? Yeah. So, so yeah. it, can can deals be done at such granular uh, approach? Or, or yeah, I mean, it's uh, uh, you have to think that this type of investment is 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 not a commodity. It's something that we have to be very creative in the in the investment part. And uh, the main difference you mentioned before that this is the new real estate. I would say that. It's even better than the real estate because there are more components, there are more revenue streams, there are more rights, there are more things that you can fit in a, something that it could be a, a, something completely new. You can sell your mechanical rights, you can sell your 
digital rights, you can sell your digital rights only in the US. I mean, you can, I mean, it's, it's a very, very long span of solutions. That's, that's why it's very important that if you are having this in mind, you have to talk to some specialists like us or some others that are in the market and understand because there are many, many solutions. There are many things <coughs> to, to find uh, the, the perfect solution for you and the perfect solution that for an investor is going to be uh, interested as exactly. well. And I understand, just to finish with that and then moving to, to the debt side, um, I understand that, that, that it's a right holder. So it can be the writer or it can be the publishing company that, that has um, acquired, that has the rights. Uh, yeah, also also the, the publishing company is, is part of the deal as well because obviously this type of, of uh, funding is very uh, based on the asset. And if you are you have the control of the asset, you can do it. Even though, for example, I have a, a very re recent experience that a publisher wants to have a, a selling their, their, their catalog. And we were talking, um, first time that we were talking to a bank in Spain, because we never talked to a bank in Spain because we have the same problem, they don't understand. We were lucky because one of the uh, people that we were talking uh, about this deal was really, really a um, lover of the music and he was able to understand everything. He was playing in a band, right? <laughs> <laughs> We don't need to spend a couple of days in a very deaf conversation. He was really, really interested. Um, and one of the things that we were discussing at the end of the day, we can, we can do the deal with the catalogs and at the end of the day, if there is a publisher behind, is a more they feel even more comfortable because there are more things. They are more professional. There is a company behind, so they will uh, even be more, they will feel more comfortable. Okay, excellent. And uh, Alison, now translating the type of question into the, the depth thing. So we've spoken about how it works in general, but if we had here right holders considering their options, mm -hmm. um, how a debt deal would work? and for who is uh, appropriate, who is you would appropriate. say? Well, uh, very similar. Um, if you're a new artist, uh, we cannot evaluate. We don't, investors generally don't take big risks. They take small risks, they take risks that they can see are guaranteed. So we would look at three years past income on streaming, neighboring rights, uh, merchandise. Um, and the calculation is based on different percentages of those three activities. Um, if you are a new artist or a, a new creator in the music industry, there are now more and more uh, opportunities to get seed funding. Uh, you know, there's STEM in the US, there's DistroKid, there's TuneCore, uh, and they are quite prepared to um, to, 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 to loan, you know, m modest amounts of money. But these days, the cost of making music is so much lower than it used to be in the 20th century. So what you really need is a fund for marketing and promotion uh, and touring and, you know, kick-starting your career because the music itself is probably one of the lowest costs of, of your, your, your approach. Um, we will loan from, in, in, in Europe, we, we, we will loan, well, across, let me explain this. Again, because of the ease with which the US work with uh, IP, we have done a deal with an American company where we will pass our um, prospects who want less than two million. We, can, we cannot lend less than two million. They will lend $50,000. Mm. Um, STEM, for example, will lend, I mean, you can go onto the STEM website and simply punch in and it will tell you how much they'll lend you. You will need to distribute through them because they use that as an earn out. But, you know, if you, if you study the market and of course with the internet, everybody can study everything, you will now find financing solutions for virtually every level from entry level to companies who, uh, and this is 
of particular interest to me because there are independent companies all over the world and the independent industry really emerged during the 70s um, at a time when everybody was independent. I suppose the better way to put that is that the majors emerged during the 70s and these days we, have, we now have three global companies and we have thousands of independent companies across the world. And many of them are still owner-managed. So these people are coming up to retirement age. They are mm. in their 60s, in their 70s. And they may not want to sell their company. Politically, they may not want to sell to a major. It's rather difficult. And I think there is a limited choice in this scenario. So what we offer is an opportunity for the management team to stay in place. Um, and it's this very similar model to an equity release. So the owner, the value, can realize a, a big sort of retirement fund, yeah. but the company yeah. is left alone to run as it chooses to run without having to see an exit. You know, the exit strategy is always the one to watch for when you're, when you're in the investment world, particularly yeah. in the venture capital world. Yeah. Mm -hmm. you know, and I'm quite interested to know because I don't know the answer, is what the exit strategy might be for the primary waves and for the hygnosises and for uh, those funds. I mean, it's, it's intriguing to me how we now have some very big IP owners, and they're not called Sony, Warner, or Universal. They're called primary wave, hypnosis, and others. But they don't have a seat at any of the CMOs. Yeah. They don't seem to want to engage with the industry. So to me, it's a quite a sort of opaque future. And I, I do worry about it a bit. Yeah, I, I mean, um, yeah, in all transparency, it's something that I've asked myself many times, like, so, uh, you're buying all these and how this is going to be managed. We, we saw, I mean, following the news as well, all these hirings by hypnosis, hiring people from the music industry for uh, what they described as um, catalog optimization and, and, you know, getting people that knows how the business runs. And yeah, one, one of the obvious things as well for, for us in Unison is like, well, you're buying all these and, and you're relying on the old school system that it's controlled by your competitors. Uh, the distribution rules are set by the boards that are controlled by who are controlled. So how, how, this, is, how this is gonna work for them, right? It's, it's a question it's, mark, but uh, at the same time you think like, these are smart people and yeah. they are hiring people, so they, they must have something. <laughs> I mean, so far, as far as I know, none of them have made an approach into the sort of management, the operational management of the industry through the CMOs or the neighboring rights societies or the trade associations or anything of that nature. And yet they are essentially record companies or publishing companies because they own these rights permanently. Uh, we, we will have to move to the audience in a minute, uh, but um, so just to fully understand, so you're Profile of clients, for example, of, of, of people that you issue are those Rec big artists that or record, record, record companies. Okay. <coughs> I mean, we will lend to record companies, publishers, producers, artists, songwriters. Our, our portfolio is quite broad. Okay. Um, so long as there is that stable income stream, um, you know, I have to warn anybody, and I'm sure it's the same with you. The due diligence process is quite tough. Yes. You know, you can't rock up with a great idea and say, you know, you want to invest in my company and not be able to produce a contract, paperwork, history. And it, to me, it is the Achilles heel of our industry, particularly in the independent sector, because admin is not the, not the, it's not the thing we do perhaps as well as we should. <laughs> so if you're going to go into this process, make sure that you have a good history, a good record, contracts, you can produce these things. Because otherwise, yeah. same with you, I guess. You yeah, I mean, it's, it's something that is, uh, in my experience, I mean, we are able to provide solutions in a very quickly uh, pace, but at the end of the day, I mean, there are some people coming, okay, I need to do this deal in 
less than 30 days. We say, okay, and then when, when you ask for the statements, it took, I don't know, maybe 60 days to, to, get, to give you the statement. So there is a part of responsibility as well in the other side. I mean, they have to professionalize, they have to be more uh, strict to the things. Obviously, this is something new for them, but as a company, you have to have every uh, statement, everything very, very under control. And I think, in my experience, we are trying also to support some, some companies that they are producing some technology in order to to, to, to make this also more fluent, because I think yeah. it can be done as well, because uh, yeah. I mean, part of the administration is, is still very manual in some of these yeah. companies. Yeah. And just to add, sorry, that, that in our case, uh, the due diligence costs, um, because there is a, a cost of all these transactions, can be uh, uh, rolled up into the uh, advance, deal. the loan. Deal, yeah. So you, you don't have to put your hand in your pocket, that comes with the package. Yeah. No, excellent. Yeah, because in the investment, not not in the music, but uh, that's always like the bar of like how how you finance the due diligence, you know? Because it's like you you're gonna look into my company, you pay the bill, or but then the investor says no. If I'm gonna look into your company, you pay the bill. <laughs> so um, yeah. yeah, excellent. Well, I think we have to uh, pass the uh, the opportunity to to make questions to the floor. So here we have one question, Rosa. Hi. Well, first, thank you so much. That was such an interesting uh, talk. I really enjoyed it. So my name is Rosa. I'm from Utopia Music. And uh, we believe absolutely a thousand percent in what you just said about music being this amazing and extraordinary asset class, uh, recession resistant or recession proof. And you've talked about you know, debt and loans and invest investment. My question, and it may be applicable to you as well, uh, Jordi, is about cash flow. It's about accelerating, um, you know, royalties being paid. So uh, it is my understanding that after an artist or a composer has generated a certain amount of royalties, it takes a while for them to be paid. So. I'd like to understand more about the cycle and what options do they currently have in terms of getting an advance on those royalties? I know what's mm -hmm. the, mm -hmm. what's the, if you want, I mean, in my, in my case, I would say that um, accelerating, I mean, for me, there are two things that are uh, key in order to make this industry to grow. First of all is the data and transparency. I think that's very important. And for example, Unison, is a really a, a good example that, uh, I mean, if you are working, or, or the artists are working with the more traditional uh, CMOs, is sometimes it's more difficult because they are not really open to listen uh, to someone who is not their, the, the, the right holder, no, as an investor. And the other one is obviously uh, accelerating. I mean, some uh, CMOs pay, I don't know, I think uh, every six months, so everything is, is it takes a, a bit longer. And at, at the end of the day, as an investor, um, my key indicator is IRR. So IRR is based on speed and, and also um, the, the, the price. So if everything goes, if the price of the valuation is fine and the speed of the cash flow is higher, it's going to be much better for me as an investor. Yeah, for like, Talking from Unison, obviously, uh, we created Unison precisely for that exact reason, uh, for transparency and efficiency. Efficiency meaning as well like quicker and more transparent collections and distributions. It is key though, as Alison was pointing out, the same importance that paperwork and admin has for the deal on debt, it has to be able to manage properly the copyright. So um, there's like the, the, the right holder, uh, needs to have good control of their metadata and and pass it on to the uh, to the people that have to manage their collections and distributions because if we don't have the you know if the contract is nonsense or there's like mistakes in the contract that they have with um, their client if it's a publishing company or an, or, or or someone that acquires catalog um, then we we get stuck right we we because if you don't give us the information, and I cannot know what are the shares of the splits of a song, unless the writer or the publishers tell me, right? Um, and you know this, and this sometimes it happens. You know, you yeah. get like a client, and uh, 
you are like looking for the splits and asking for the splits like once and again and again and again uh, so that you can actually collect and distribute. But um, based on that, we, we did a platform that we did and um, yeah, I, we're like in, in digital, we're like six months to a year faster than our competitors and we hope to keep on improving that. That's great. I just. Yeah, just wanted, that's so interesting because I just wanted to share that, for example, Utopia in the United States, we own Lyrics Financial, so we've got a deal with a DSP, with a distribution company and artists, uh, they're able to log into the area and they see the royalties they've generated and just within a couple of clicks they're able to access funds. Mm -hmm. and, and so I just wanted to understand if there are any other similar alternatives. Yeah, I know, I know perfectly Lyric Financial and, and, and I know we were in contact with them a couple of years ago and they are doing a really, really great job in the US. And I think what's really amazing is that the majority of those, ad well, uh, th they're advances, but we call it accelerated royalties. Uh, actually, they tend to be really lower value, like $1,000, $2,000, because they're just musicians, like, you know, that need to pay rent or they need to reinvest that music, that, that money for touring or, or et cetera. So, so yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I, I just want to add something to this very interesting sure. dynamic, which has just come into the conversation. Uh, and you are a good example of a, a modern approach to uh, collecting and distributing royalties. Um, across the world, there are still um, some very old-fashioned uh, thinking around how money is collected and distributed. Tell me about it, yeah. <laughs> uh, I, 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 you and I know, you and I know. And I, I think that the adoption of, which exists and has existed for some years now, of tracking, uh, identifying usage has not been adopted by some of the bigger countries because it would lead to more accurate distribution. And this is... I didn't say that, huh? <laughs> this, you, this thank is, you, Alison. This, this is the big frontier next because how long can companies hide behind the lack of adoption of readily available technology which would allow you to do exactly what you've just said. Um, and why is it that in 2022, we still sometimes, in fact, I think in this country, you do, but if I'm wrong, I'm sorry, that, that the, one of the collecting societies distributes on a market share model based on pop radio stations. For some types of, uh, of usages, yeah, that's uh, my awareness is that they, they do it like that for certain types of, of usage. So, you know, that means that anybody that's in R&B or, or hip hop or mm. any of the other genres, and there are millions of other genres, are not even, they're not being measured. I mean, it, this is about money flowing to the rights holder. This is simply, it should be a straight line usage rights holder. The technology exists, the will to, create that does not yet exist quite so much as we all would like. Yeah, and uh, in the previous panel, um, uh, Cristina Perpiña was kind enough to sort of point out how difficult sometimes for the uh, all structures is to deal with mo like um, like fraction licensing and, and all that, and how she said how much simpler it was in a world where you had just one per country, but we know what this led to one per country, no competition, no no other, you know, it's like how, how you distribute this money, what is the incentive for innovation, and that's why the European Union actually um, issued, not, not you, like, I know you're the investment <laughs> fund, but you know, I was like, not, not, not you as the European Union, but the European Union uh, changed, uh, decided to change and go to more like the US type of uh, mindset in terms of like, let's have several that can do it, and that, mm. you know, that competition brings in um, mm. more services and better services to, to the clients or members, but, um, okay. Some questions yeah. over oh, there. another question, sorry, another question here. We still have three, four, five minutes, so we're on time. Hi, hello. I probably, my question will probably be to Laura. Yeah. Um, so I think it seems to be all these great solutions, financial solutions, which obviously without the finances, as, as Alison pointed out, the creation might face death very quickly. <laughs> so yet um, those solutions seems to be already 
mature to a place for creators that already are at a certain place, or financial funds, or systems, or companies that are already at a certain place. So sort of, so it's a great place to be, but yet there's the whole road before that for a lot of creators, and that's where they need the most that financial help. And so I guess even if a young artist, creator, it can cross across music industry, like it goes beyond, right? They come to a bank and despite the guarantees, if the mindset is not there, what are the criteria? They're as, <laughs> as they were in 2016, you know, five years on, we're in the same place and they're still struggling. Managers don't take on if you don't have track records. Every company has terrible administration, very complicated depending on the industries, etc. to create companies to, again, put yourself there. So I guess my question is there is there something that we might be missing out that is ob obviously available and or will be made available? Is, is there awareness of, of that particular sector and element to address? Thank you. Uh, no, you are right that uh, it's, it's very difficult for uh, startups or new ideas to, to get financing and, and perhaps bank financing is not the, the right path for, for those young um, musicians and, and uh, creatives. And um, that's why we also, we have launched now also the equity um, support because there in venture capital, venture capital is they, they do invest, uh, they do provide seed financing. Uh, for example, uh, one of the funds that we have supported had invested in Spotify before we knew what Spotify was, for example. Um, as at the IF, we unfortunately we don't give grants or subsidies that will be a form of financing needed uh, for the very initial sta um, stages uh, of an idea, uh, but with our uh, activities and our role, we try to develop the financing markets. Um, as, as I explained before, making um, EU uh, money available into the financiers uh, help direct this financing to the final recipients, as we call them, that we want to support. And uh, as more investments are made, more success stories uh, are uh, coming into play and more traction is coming to a certain industry. We've seen that um, in, in several countries, for example, that they, were, they didn't have a venture capital ecosystem before uh, we entered into that ecosystem and, and now it has been developed and more investments are, are uh, made. Uh, and we aim to do the same uh, for now with the launch of the equity support on, on the um, CCS site. For the um, uh, audiovisual and the film uh, production and distribution, we are a bit more advanced um, in the sense that we've launched a specific uh, program just now uh, for equity investments only uh, for film and uh, production and distribution. Uh, music is covered our, under our general uh, product for the CCS, but um, we've already, as I said, we launched a call for expression of interest in April, and we've already seen some applications from music funds. Um, and I think we, we we're going to experience, we hope we are going to experience this, um, um, you know, the, the what we want to achieve to develop the, the financing ecosystem also for new artists and creatives. Thank Excellent. You. Um, I mean, we're just on time. It's two o'clock. Um, so we, th th there was another question. Sorry, like, uh, we can wait like a couple of minutes, right? Let's, let's get sorry, the last I'm question sorry. in. Yeah, okay, yeah go you. ahead, go ahead. Yeah, uh, my question is with the um, rise of more fan let's say, powered investments like Royalty Exchange or like Sunvest, <coughs> do you see this as a reliable maybe source of funding for independent artists? Do you think it's safer to go more like the institutional route? 
Um, or do you think that this can actually be a market that can really raise a significant amount of money for independent artists? Uh, I would say that royalty chains, home best, all these type of platforms are the perfect deal for independent because usually institutionals are more focused on big artists um, like hypnosis. Of if you go to whatever bank, I mean, it's going to be a very difficult, um, a very difficult discussion. However, uh, the new platforms that we are seeing in the U.S. Um, they are under my opinion, a perfect fit for the independent because at the end of the day, the way they use to evaluate the, the, um, the asset, it's, it's pretty fair because they launch an auction and then the price is gonna be set by the appetite of the investors. So at the end of the day, uh, uh, whatever financial market is working in the same methodology. So basically, if you are able to sell that your catalog is very good, very attractive, is growing so fast because you were doing a lot of work in order to allocate your catalog in different places to generate a lot of incomes. I mean, people is going to have a lot of appetite to buy shares on your catalog. If your catalog is something more flat, I mean, people will appreciate that the people on Royalty Exchange or some best that we know perfectly, they are doing a very good job on the education of the uh, uh, investor community and all investors that are behind those platforms, they really well know what they are buying. So I think it's a, it's a good way. I mean, we, we really hope that in Europe we, we, were, we will be able to develop this type of platforms that is a marketplace that you need people in one side uh, that is willing to put their catalog there to get some funding and the other side well-educated investors that are able to really put money on your catalog. And on that note, I think that for me, you wanted to say something, Alison? Well, oh, I just wanted to say one last thing, uh, which sure. is that the amount of music that's going onto the platforms now is, um, it's, an, it's a new age. And, uh, you know, the platforms are very keen to diversify. Um, the market share for the major record companies is declining because there is just so much music. So it does come down to the simple old fashioned things, which if you write a great song or you record a great song and you get it onto those platforms and it starts to get traction, you will have the beginnings of a career and that career you will own. You won't need to, you know, you, you won't necessarily at that point need to, to, to sell or to, sign or to do anything other than just you know learn a lot you can learn how to run your career but it is a great time to to it, so long as your music is it people want to hear it that that was exactly the way i wanted to finish that because i was thinking now hearing to all of Sorry. you thinking like no 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 but i was thinking on 25 years ago you know when i got into the music industry and all that and now like all these options that are available all these we need the knowledge from the right holders and from the creators to, to understand all these options, but seriously, like all these alternatives that were unthinkable, like not 25, 10 years ago, and now, you know, to be a, a creator or having a publishing company or a record label, now you have all this availability. And as we were saying, Blackstone put a thousand million, a billion, it's gonna put four, four billion more uh, KKR, Everyone, it's seeing now, it seems that finally everyone is understanding because of the digital, that's why we're here, <laughs> traceability. So I think it's an incredibly exciting moment uh, to be in this, in, in our industry. And with that optimistic note, which is always a good way to end, we're gonna, we're gonna end this session. Please, a big round of applause to this amazing panelists that we've had with us today. Thank you so much for joining us.